whisky.de. Treffpunkt Feiner Geister. But also in that effect, we get a maturization loss. In other words, when the whiskey is maturing, we lose whiskey out through the cask. I'm sure you've seen next door the glass heads in this place. So after about 18 years, we've lost about 42% of the whiskey in maturization loss, what we call the angel share. Um, so we've got that unique property with white oak. We use two types of white oak here in Middleton. We use uh, European white oak in our shelly casks. Um, which is this one here, and our pork pipes. Um, and the other oak we use is American white oak, which is used in the American bourbon cask. Um, as I said, what I have here is an American oak ring. Um, it's specially cut when you're making a cask. It's quarter sawn. Uh, in other words, the log is cut to length, and then it's split into quarters, and then the boards are cut at this angle. Because what you're trying to achieve is get the rings at 90 degrees to the board. Um, and when you do that, you get a lot more strength. And you need all the strength you can get in your timber. So that when you go to bend the cask to form that shape, you don't want to get the cracking going on. If you just plant the timber, you would get the planking. Now if you buy, say, furniture or home, if you buy an oak floor, more likely it's going to be planked. Um, and it's going to look like that, more or less. If you get a quarter sawn oak floor, you're going to get this beautiful grain coming out, what we call McDully rays. Right? even short for it. Um, you'll see it a lot on fine oak furniture and stuff like that. Cabinet makers will buy quarter sawn timber. But you're going to pay two, three times the price for quarter sawn as opposed to plank. That's one of the main differences uh, with the oak as well is the way it's cut. Um, the early gills that were formed uh, uh, for both coopering or even blacksmith or silversmith or whatever had a quality control attached to it. So if you were making a cask uh, 400 years ago and you didn't use quarter sawn timber, you could be thrown out of the guild and you wouldn't be able to practice as a cooper under, unless under another master. So it was very strict in what timber was used. In regards to the tools, um, some of the tools here are kind of unique to Jameson uh, or, or to Middleton. Uh, for example, these timber compasses would have been made by a cooper himself. Um, these have been handed down to me. This one in particular I know is from a great uncle um, um, it's got a finer finish and the reason for that is, is that he had it when he worked as a cooper in the British Navy. As every ship had to have a cooper in order to maintain the water barrels or whatever casts were on board. Um, and being in the Navy his tools even had to be a finer finish. Um, and this particular one would have been used um, for what we call a firkin. And a firkin is about the size of the cast that the anvil is on. Um, if, if any of you have, heard, have been in Cork before, we have a famous area in Cork called the Frog. Six times, that gives you your circumference. Um, very ancient technology, I mean, it, it, there's nothing new in that, but that's your, how you get your size of your head. So using a broad compass on a bigger cask, six times and maybe a couple of mil more, you know, because it's a bit bigger. So, as I said, compasses were kind of unique here to Middleton, um, in, both in Scotland and France, other places. They tend to use dividers. In some parts of France, right, they do have a similar type of timber compass, um, but it's kind of unique. With some of the tools as well, they're named after animals. Uh, for example, this tool is a holding tool, and it's to grab the top of the stave, to pull it back, so you can get at the inside. So if I was putting a rush, one of these rushes, on the inside of the cask, in order to act as a seal, I would pull it back with this, but I mean, I often ask people what do they think it's called. I won't prolong the agony, but it's called a dog. And you can see it's got two ears on it or whatever. Now, traditionally in cabinet making and, and carpentry, if you hold a piece of timber to a bench, they use a dog to hold the timber. So it's transferred onto other crafts as well. But you can, I like to think that this is where it originated. Um, again, keeping with the, the names of animals in, in the tools. Um, this tool is a type of spoke shave for shaving. Uh, it would have been used to flatten the head of a cask. Um, it's called a swift. Um, for those of you from different parts, a, a type of the swallow family. And it's got, as you can see, it's almost got two wings on it. Um, so again, keep with the names. If you go to different regions like Scotland or France or whatever, they have different names on similar tools. 
because the craft is so old, I mean the earliest recording of Cooper is 1900 BC, the hieroglyphs in Egypt. So it's going back at least 4,000 years. Um, so because of that and longevity of the craft, different names applied and different tools developed in different areas, such as I said, the compass. Um, coming with the knives, what we call knives, and these would have been a very common tool uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, even with carpenters or whatever. Um, people who would have been in the States making log cabins would still use something like this. Chair makers would still use it to make spindles. Uh, walking stick makers traditionally still use it, and you can still buy them from catalogs. Um, what you won't be able to buy is, is this particular one, it's called a, a wrong, sh wrong shave, and it's to form the hollow of the inside of the, the cast. So when you shave with it, it's unique to coopering because it's, it's only specialised in that shape. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate those two things later on. Another tool that would have been used would have been, say, a cooper's axe. Um, now when you look at this, you probably think it's a bit of a beast of a thing that you, know, you wouldn't use it in anything. Or, but it's quite clever in its design in that the handle is splayed away from the blade. So that when I go to cut, um, when I go to carve a stave, I don't clip my fingers. Um, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. So, and it's, it's actually quite clever in, in the way it carves a stave. Um, so I'll explain that better later. Um, another tool that's used, with what we call here again, animal name, it's a crow's. Um, and it cuts a groove in the stave. And what I mean by stave are these long pieces here. So what I want to do with that crows is cut this groove. So I'm going to cut it when the cask is made in full. But just to give you an idea of how it works, it sits into that groove there and rides along the top of the cask, cutting the groove. Um, and you can see how old this is even. Um, I still use it all the time. Another tool that is quite common um, in cooperating would be an adz. Um, I suppose a modern version would be, say, a garden hoe um, would be a take on it. It's still used a lot throughout the world. It's one of the unique tools in that it developed independently in different cultures without those cultures having been met. So three tools that would have developed would have been a hammer, an axe, and an adz. I mean, North American Indians had it, um, Polynesians had it um, in the Far East, as well as in Europe. So, like, in, in, in Polynesians, they would have got giant clams, made it, and carved out hollow canoes. So essentially what an adze is, it's an axe turned sideways. So instead of being like that, it goes that shape. Um, and the early versions would have been of stone, of flint, uh, going out to bronze, and so on. So those three tools as such would have been the earliest tools in mankind's history, going back easily 10,000 years. Um, uh, recently I saw an edge being used in traditional boat building in Egypt to recreate uh, Cleopatra's old boat they used adz. So 2,000 years ago they were still using it. Um, anybody, any questions? Am I moving along too quick? Um, but a four pound hammer. Um, and the other tool we would have had is what we call a driver. So it's used to push down the hoops and you've got to hold it in a special way, you've got to hold it like that. If you hold it like that, with your fingers exposed, and you miss, you're not going to have fingers too long. So you can't <laughs> neglect that. Um, I did work with a chap who put out his finger one time in the top hoop and missed, and nearly took the top of the finger off, so you can't get careless. The other thing with this hammer is that it belonged to a friend of mine who I worked with for many years, and when he left, I asked him for it, because even I understood the significance and the value of something like this. He had it his entire working life. His father had it before him his entire working life. And under both generations, they never changed the handle. So the handle wore to the shape of their grip. If I was to use this hammer, my, my hand would just cramp. It's too thin, I'm used to a, a thicker handle. Um, the other thing with it as well is that there's no wear. Um, and the reason there's no wear is that when they struck anything, they always struck exactly on the ball of the hammer. So if they were on the anvil making hoops or on the cask, they had perfect technique. If they didn't, it, the, handle, the hammer would have wore and the handle probably would have snapped. 
And what that means is that you never developed an injury. You never got a tennis elbow or a shoulder injury or whatever. So, like every tool, if they're used properly, you shouldn't get an injury. If you use them incorrectly, like maybe this one, which is about 25 years old, because he hit everything sideways, and that was just his own particular style, um, probably going to end up with some kind of injury later in life. Um, so, as I said, that's the Cooper's Hammer. Um, if anybody wants to have a look at the tools or touch them or pick them up in, later on, by all means. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take it to this corner. If anybody can timber, uh, what we would call a block. And a Cooper would always go to his block. He would never actually go to a bench. It would always be his block. Um, so I'm just going to show you how an, an axe is used. Um, if you start out with your plank and timber, what you're trying to create is wider in the middle, narrower on top. So you want to remove timber as quickly as you can. The faster you could work, the more cast you could make, the more you got paid. So just think of an idea of how an axe would work. And you can see it's just peeling away from the timber. So even though it looks quite ugly and everything else, it's quite efficient once you get the skill to use it as well. So that's what you're looking to do is make it narrow on top, wider in the middle. Now I wouldn't be as good with an axe as my ancestors would have been because I just use it on display, I don't use it every day anymore. Um, but that's traditionally how an axe would have been used. <laughs> the next process would have been in, in the knives, as I said earlier, a Halloween knife to run the inside the stave. Now what I would normally do that on is this tool here. It's called a horse. Still very common tool worldwide. Uh, still used by, as I said, maybe chair makers, stick makers, to grab timber. So this arm comes down because he's putting pressure with his foot on the board, grabs the stave, and then uses a knife to shape the stave. But I'm just going to show you on the block because the one I have is next door on display. So just to give an idea how the Holland knife is used. And as I said, you want to remove timber quickly. Now, if I had a horse, you could do it quicker and more accurately. But you get an idea of how the Halloween knife is used. And a backing knife, <coughs> as I said, um, a tool still used an awful lot. Um, so, just to round the outside of the stave then. The inside like that, and the outside, round it. Instead. So you get an idea of how fast you can remove timber. Uh, and as I said, if I had a horse, I'd have more accuracy. But you get the idea, traditionally, how a stave is made. I mean, nowadays, because of the volume of casks needed, you couldn't possibly make a, a cask <coughs> from scratch by hand. Um, most of them are made machine-wise. Um, the next step after you use a stave like that would be to use a tool like this. Call it jointer. Um, if you imagine in carpentry where you hold the timber and you run the plane over it, it's the exact <coughs> opposite in coopering. We hold the plane and we run the timber over it. So just to show you exactly how it works. Um, and by angling my hands, I can change the angle of the timber to achieve the angles on the stave. This particular one is just used for making heads. You can see almost like a head, the top of the cask, because it's short. The stave for staves will be much longer. Um, and you can see how fast you remove timber again, as I said, and it's a lot smoother. What you don't want to do is drop your hands on the way down, because you're not going to have much skin left at the end of it. So, you, again, different skill set. So with all the tools, there are different skill sets needed with the different tools. It's not just the same thing all the time. Uh, somebody asked me where to go, would you just concentrate on making one part of the cask and someone else do another part? No, you wouldn't. You would do the whole thing from start to finish. 
So you make your staves, you make your heads, you make your hoops, you do everything yourself. Um, so it wasn't like a, re a regular production line. Um, anyone have any questions? Move along. Um, the three types of casts we have in Middleton are a, a pork pipe, a sherry butt, and a bourbon cask. So I just point over here. So you can see your pork cask is a lot redder than the pork, but you can also see the Medulli rays coming out. The sherry the same. The difference with the American bourbon cask in particular is the charring or toasting as we call it. Um, it's a lot heavier. They don't want that effect when they make port or sherry. They want a big charcoal effect coming through. What it does for whiskey uh, in particular is it, it, it helps to get the vanillas and the tannins and everything in the oak quicker into the whiskey. It takes that skin off the timber. The charcoal in effect in itself helps as a little bit of a filter to remove any undesirables that might be in the spirit. Um, it also creates a bigger surface area in helping the spirit to, to get into around the oak as well. So in whiskey it's quite acceptable because we can filter that out any charcoal effect after. But in bourbon cast they say that's the main difference in toasting. Um, so there are three types of casts we have in Middleton. Now we do have other types of casts such as hogsheads and whatever, but they're the main ones. In regards to the bourbon cask, we'll import something like 110,000 this year. In regards to the sherry cask, we've import, we imported today 5,000. Um, when we're choosing casks, um, we ask for the best quality in each cask. For the American bourbon cask, you have 10 categories you can choose from. We go first category, first select, the best quality cask we can buy. For lots of reasons. One, we want the best quality oak best finish and um, we don't want any trouble with the cask after when it's in warehouse and um, the same to sherry casks and um, I know we have people who go and inspect the cask before they arrive to make sure they're of top quality. Every cask that arrives on site is examined by a cooper either myself or the other cooper to ensure the quality is maintained and um, what we don't want is when we go filling the cask we end up with a lot of leaks or a lot of problems or whatever. The one thing that happens at this time of the year with casks in particular, in particular the bourbon casks, and I'm not sure if you've been to warehouse or not yet, um, but they start to expand, they start to kind of build up. So in the winter they contract and in the summer or spring they start expanding in. And in that expansion, because of the movement, you're going to get a couple of leaks appearing. But you could come back tomorrow or next week and it's all actually taken up again. So again, with the air interacting with the cask and the temperature difference, we're getting that almost living, breathing cask going on. Um, and as I say, with the oak that we use and the warehousing, everything is such of a high quality, and it really is. And the same with the cask we buy. Um, to ensure that the product we produce at the end of it, Jameson or Middle Rear or whatever, is of the highest quality. Um, and attention to detail is unbelievable in every aspect that we do. As I say, every single cask is examined and nosed. Every sherry cask that comes in, or pork cask, is nosed to see if anything has happened in, in, the, in the transport. Because there's a little bit of sherry left inside, you could possibly get a second fermentation or whatever go on. So, as I say, the quality is a problem. What I'm going to do for you now, I'm going to open a sherry bud, just to explain how it's done. As I said, because the craft is so old, this hasn't changed for literally 2,000 years. A cast similar to this was pulled out of a bog in England that the Romans used. It had the exact same number of hoops, contained the same volume, and looked the same. So it hasn't literally changed, or the fact that the way I will repair it, which I showed you now, hasn't changed either. So it's quite old in that respect. Um, so I'm just going to take... cask has its name and that you have this section which we call the bulge in the states they call it the bilge and um, each hoop has its own name this would be a bulge hoop, quarter hoop, chime hoop, master hoop the name of the top of the cask you have center, quarter, cantle now that's only matters to a cooper as such but if you're trying to explain to somebody what was wrong with the cask 
you could name what part of the cask exactly was causing trouble or whatever. Um, so, so you're more than welcome to come up and sniff the cask. And let me know what was in this cask it was James the Twelve. Ronald, and there's two here, and there's two representatives as well. Now you can see the inside of the camera. Right? Right. It has yeah. been charred. Yeah. It's, it's a special job charring a barrel. Yeah. We don't do it here. But you'd do it if you had to use the barrel four or five times, you know, in Scotland you use them six or seven times, mm -hmm. maybe eight. <laughs> but uh, you take the top out, the head, and the bottom out of it, and you tighten down your hoops. <laughs> Just tighten the whole lot down, uh, and you'll be putting your head hoop on it. Now, The reeds. You can get those in Scotland. They're the same as what we're talking about, what we've seen out there. It's got to be just especially uh, grown for it. They're like a gasket, in other words. So you just take that, so there's finger. That. I'm putting it, but you would put it in a lot tighter than that. Understand? Me? You put it right in right into the controls. I'll show you now. Put the uh, hoop. Show you. Where I'm putting that at the moment is into the crows of the bar. That's what it would fit into, and the head then would come in against that. You follow? You understand me? The head would come in against that, and then when you would, when there would be spirit put into that barrel, it would expand and would work as a gasket, as you were saying. But I never heard of it. No, it wouldn't have any effect on the quality of the uh, of the whiskey. Right. Now, say you had, had all that done, uh, and you had your head hoop back on. Right, you then had to check that bar to see what it leak. So you take out your bung, put in roughly two litres of water into it, old water, or hot water, it doesn't matter. Put in what you call a rubber bung, put the bung out, put that in, put in your air line, and put in approximately 10 pounds of air, 10 to 12 pounds of air. And we had a Russian chap here about six months ago. <laughs> 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 he put 100 pounds in. He, he put too much air into the barrel anyway, okay, and he blew the head out of it. Oh. I'd never seen this happen before. And it, <laughs> there was a table, it wasn't here, it was in, in there where we filled. And there was a table over there and he broke the two legs, broke the legs of the table. <laughs> and I was just saying, thank God there was no one there. Oh, yeah, that, you know, yeah. It broke your own bloody legs, you know. Oh, yeah. I'd never seen it happen before, you know. 10 or 12 pounds, I say he put about 50 or 60, maybe 100 pounds, but I think, but I'll give way anyway. But you put about 10 or 12 pounds of air into it, you drop her down, drop her down such as, and you roll her about, okay? You roll her about the cat, she leaked her. Then you're watching for bubbles. If you ever checked your tyre on your bicycle, the tube, and you're watching for bubbles where it's coming out, where the air is blowing the water out in, into any little holes of that, any little vents that's in it. Nine times out of ten, it won't happen. And nine times out of ten, when you then get your uh, your driver and your hammer again, and you just tap the whole lot back down again, you tighten the whole lot up. And you stand here, you have your head hoop on, you put on your head hoop and you tap them all down, and you turn the ball around and do the same on the other side. That usually fixes it, but if it doesn't, and most of the things that would be wrong would be your bung state, because it gets a lot, a lot of abuse. 
And as you can see, there is a crack in that, and it's, it's below half, and it's usually when it's below half, that will crack. You know, it's amazing because there's very long grain in, in uh, oak, and you wouldn't think it would, would crack, but it will, because that's in more contact with the ground than any other part of the barrel. So you, we wouldn't do anything with that. We'd uh, send that to Kilbegan to have it recuperate. He'd take out cannibalize, we like to call it. He'd take out that bunk, that uh, stave out of the bar, and put a new bunk stave into it. Send it, send it back. Yeah. Yeah. Then empty the water. When you've checked her out, it's okay. You empty the water out of her then, and you can fill it. She's ready for filling. 